Hey, 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 come on down and welcome to the making of Playing With Songs. I'm Rob Langley-Jones and this is episode number four. If you're wondering why I made a silly voice at the beginning of the show, that was in homage to a great game that I played back in the day through the early 90s to the early 2000s. I won't name it in case I get in trouble with copyright, but it was a great game and it was made by Sega. So the way we left things last week, back in episode number three, was that I was going to start mapping out... um, first episode or the first episode of the new format of playing with songs produced so I did do that and I'll get to that in a bit but before then I just want to touch on how I've been working through these songs for the job I've got in the summer many songs to learn and on the guitar and I've been trying with these little pomodoros 25 minute chunks and a little five minute meditation which was working great but I just still felt under so much pressure because then I was then trying to practice the songs blindfold which was helping a lot and I was really putting so much pressure on myself to get the songs kind of performance ready straight away and I must finish a whole song and it must be ready to go out there and gig and that was just all becoming a bit too much to be honest so I decided to take a new approach I'm still going to do all of the little learning tips and tricks but I'm just going to do them bit by bit I'll begin to learn a song and the lyrics and and the structure and how the chords are played and sort of see you know what sticks and what doesn't and then what doesn't stick I'll add stories to tie things together and use the location method in order to remember how things are laid out, just to really just take the pressure off and uh, be a bit kinder to myself, as it were. And in doing this, the other thing that came up was often you'll find things come to mind during the day, don't they? Oh, I really have been putting this off for a long time. I really need to buy a new pair of jeans, for example. And I do. I've only got one pair of decent jeans. And I would usually just think, oh, you know, I'll have to deal with that later. I need to deal with it when I need to buy all the clothes I need because I need some more socks as well. I thought, well, I can only buy jeans when I buy the socks. And I've been trying this new approach of being easy on myself and thinking, well, yeah, I do need some more jeans. Is that going to make my life better? Is this something I'm going to need to do at some point? And if the answer to those questions are yes, I think, okay, well, I'll just do it now then. And so I did. And so I did that for a few things. So I've also been looking into how to better care for my teeth. They're not perfect, as you can see. Hopefully they'll look better at some point because I will be having a proper hygienist session and I'm really going to work hard to make these teeth lovely and healthy and clean under the gum line and use interdental brushes and all these kind of things. And so those kind of thoughts would creep into my head and I think, well... Maybe I should get this other kind of brush and maybe I should try that. And rather than quieting that voice and think, no, 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 I must get these other tasks done. I must learn these songs. I must plan out the next episode of Playing With Songs. I would think and ask myself again, are these things going to benefit me? You know, is it going to be good to have better health in my mouth? Um, And I was like, well, yes, that's great. I've always wanted that. So that's what I've been doing um, this week, is just being a bit kinder. If little thoughts pop in my head of things that are actually going to help me out a lot, I'll do them. So it doesn't mean I sort of say yes to every little whim. For example, uh, last night, I just really wanted to eat something else before I went to bed. And I thought, well, is this going to help? Uh, and like, it was no for multiple reasons. One, it would mean it would be a lot closer to eating and cleaning your teeth, which is, which is bad for your teeth. You want to allow some time for all the acidity I guess to subside and and two it's extra food and I am trying to lose a little bit of weight I need to lose about a stone or so which is um, 14 pounds for for Americans um, and so I thought well it's going to make both of those things harder so is it going to make my life better mm, no so instead I just cleaned my teeth and got ready and went to bed and that was fine And it wasn't a big deal. I didn't feel like I was depriving myself. I was quite happy, slept through, and didn't have breakfast until quite late today. So that's been the approach. And so far it's working, touch wood. Um, I recommend everyone, you know, give it a go. Because people often say to me, and I'm sure it's been said to you as well, you know, just be good to yourself and yada, 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 and, you know, 
and don't be so hard on yourself and take care of yourself. And I've never really, I don't think, done that. Not 100%. There's always this this nagging like, oh, I shouldn't be thinking that, I should be thinking this, or I shouldn't be doing this, I should be doing that. And this time I'm sort of going with the flow. Even to the point when uh, I've got my DS, which I bought again. I wish I'd kept it now, Nintendo DS. It's probably my favourite games consoles. Some of my most favourite games on it, like The World Ends With You and and uh, Ace Attorney and Ghost Trick and oh, just brilliant games. And I wanted to try, because I've been learning a lot about learning, of um, having a go, a proper go for the first time of the Professor Layton games. And I did, and um, they've been quite fun, actually. They're quite well made. I'm playing the one Unwound in Time, I believe it's called. And it's good fun, and I'm surprised how much voice acting is in there. I don't know how they fit it on the little cartridge. Now, I'm, I must admit, and this is very naughty, that I have pirated it on one of those little pirated carts. But... Um, oh, I only did that a little bit when I originally had the DS, and I did own all of my favourite games, all of the Ace Attorney ones and, and everything. There was only the odd game here and there that I played more as a pirate game. And there's a brilliant version of Okami, called Okami Den. Oh, there's so many amazing games on the DS, such a brilliant console. I just loved it. It was like a combination of the two best things for me, is the SNES nostalgia and the 16-bit nostalgia, which I've got a, a great deal of nostalgia for, and the 32-bit nostalgia which had only just been and gone and you've a combination of these games that look partly 32 bit and partly 16 bit oh it's just brilliant even the shading i think on the 3d graphics was must have worked in a similar way to the playstation in that it's really blocky and dropping in and out anyway it was really really great so that's been uh, one of the new approaches that i've been applying this week One more thing to talk about before we update you on our progress on what would be uh, episode three or the first episode in the, the new format of Playing With Songs produced. So before I update you on that, I've been going through another little exercise in thinking. And, uh, you know, there's different ways to think about things. And the example I'm going to give here is the way to think through your past mistakes. And... You know, usually I push all this kind of stuff to the back of my mind, I'm sure a lot of people do. But the simple idea was to yeah, find the mistake, was it really, what really happened, what really didn't happen, and then keep asking why. Why, 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 and keep asking why until you run out of whys. And then think, you know, how can we do it differently next time? How can prevent this from happening? And I, I did this exercise going back through... I would say it's probably six sort of big things that have happened in my life, big-ish, you know, and it's and I sort of think it's a shame it went that way. Could I have done something differently? And what I found is that how five five of these out of the six could have all wouldn't have happened had I have now been applying my new approach to learning, which is in huge thanks to Jim Quick's book, Limitless. I'm not affiliated, but it's just fantastic. There's so many techniques in there about motivation and mindset and methods to learn things. Had I been doing all that in these situations in the past, they wouldn't have turned out the way they did. And I would have had so many options open to me. And who knows where I'd be right now? So it is really such a revelation. And I wish they would teach, and I think they're beginning to in some small way, all of these methods in schools. Because if you knew all of this, you know, when you're like 12, 13, 14, my God, life would be easy, so easy. Even just having a growth mindset and believing you can learn any skill, which you can. You know, there's very little limitations that we have, especially living in a privileged Western world. And, yeah, it's just it's just great, really great. You take those limitations away and you are quite honestly limitless. Of course you are. Right, 
so possibly the part you've been waiting for. Has he made any more progress with Playing With Songs, episode three, Playing With Songs Produced, which is a song called Stay? And well, yes and no. So I started off looking at the feel and groove, found that the, when I played the song, it started with this kind of driving feeling and an emphasis on beats two and beats three and a half, interestingly, and then the emphasis would change when the verses start into beats two and four. I've got a reggae section that doesn't quite have a reggae feel, but it'd be nice to put a reggae feel into it. And I had some ideas for a syncopation to add into it, one of the verses that has a more jazzy chord progression. And the emotional journey was one of longing and loss and of the happy times to continue, plus the happiness of the time that we still had, me and my really, really good friend. She's just absolutely amazing. She still is. She's brilliant. She's fantastic. And still having a bit of time left to enjoy each other's company, each other's company, in fact, one last time. And so the message of the song, I guess, is one of sadness and loss, but of joy in the time that we still have. So very relatable to everyone. So... I really wanted to get so specific. I just want a template so I can just use this template and say, okay, these are the steps we take. And so I tried to go through in Logic Pro adding the notes for each section. If you added a marker set, for those of you that have used Logic Pro, it's not very easy just to click on each marker and see the text. Um, you have to click on the double click on the marker and then sometimes double click on the text to edit it. So it's a bit obtuse and not as useful as I thought it would be. The most useful thing has probably been the arrangement markers at the top and you can move around the arrangement. And then there's just, just the main chunk of notes is useful just to have one chunk of text. But trying to click in between each chunk for the bass and each chunk for the drums was just rather impractical. So then I set about writing up... Uh, a table document like an Excel document or a numbers document and putting in categories in there saying this is the chunk number, that's the field groove and the emotion and that became a bit cumbersome as well and it began to be a bit tricky. Then I went back to the approach they use in journalism which can be useful for everything you want to communicate really is what's the who, the what, the where, the why, the when and the how. I sort of like who is this song about, who is it for, who is it written with, what is this song about, where is this song written set, why does this song exist, is it fast or slow, da 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 da, when is the song written and set, how is the song played, blah 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 blah. And I kind of thought, well, those questions, yeah, they could be useful, I think, to give a bit more context to what's going on. But I don't think they'll inform us specifically how I want to add new sections to it and add bass sections and drum sections to it. So I decided to come up with a more detailed list of how to establish the feel and groove. I sort of write down, you know, which beats are emphasised, which beats are less emphasised. Are there any strange rhythms or syncopation? Which parts are legato or staccato or somewhere in between? I don't probably know enough musical terms to describe them. Um, note down the use of vibrato in the singing or even the guitar playing um, and straight notes or combinations. Uh, note down the different kind of dynamics. Are there any glissandos where the notes go, oh, oh, and move up and down in pitch and slide? Are there any words emphasised? If so, for what effect? Are there any beats ahead or behind the beat? Is it racing or dragging? If so, where? And I looked at that list and I thought, hmm, you know what medium would communicate all of that information in one go in a relatively, well, not a simple way, but a way that can just be read straight away, would be in sheet music. And I don't know that much about sheet music. I did do music theory, got up to grade six, but this is th um, 14 years ago, so I've forgotten a lot of that. So I could go back and learn a lot of more of that. And that would add in almost every bit of information I want, which would be very, very useful. And then I'd be able to just see, oh, OK, this is what we've got and this is how it fits. I wonder if I can add this bit in. It might mean that in time I'll get to that point the luxurious point that a lot of musicians are in, and rightly so, where they've learned sheet music so well that they can kind of see the notes, hear it in their head, hear what could work together, and write it out before they even hear it happen, which is great, you know? I mean, that saves even more time, doesn't it? And so that would just be a matter of time, wouldn't it? Put the time in to learn these things and then do that. And that's kind of a sort of an example in some ways of exponential thinking whereby... Rather than thinking one step ahead, you think many more steps ahead. So obviously it would take a long time to learn to fully read and write sheet music and sight read. But it will mean that then this process will become a lot quicker because then I can listen to the song, quickly write, notate it out and say, OK, this is what we've got. Maybe we can fit something around this bit or this bit and you can just see it. 
The only drawback that I've found, and I've begun to do some research to get around this and not yet found anything conclusive, is the last point that I mentioned about are any beats ahead or behind the beat? Is it racing or dragging? So for those that don't know, if you're playing something in 4-4, four, four, and that, for example, could be on, on the beat. It's just quite difficult to explain blame without a, without a metronome, uh, which I don't have to hand, unfortunately. But say this was the metronome, you could be behind the beat, so you go to doom to doom, just a smidgen behind the beat, or you could be in front of the beat. Oh, I can't I can't do it. But you get the idea. But there are some much more wonderful videos on YouTube that explain this. But basically, you have these feelings. If that's the beat and you're a bit ahead, it will sound a bit like it's racing and a bit lighter and a bit more exciting and a bit more excited. And you sometimes hear that, I think, in some pop, punk rock music and some punk, punk music as well, and it kind of races and races. Um, I've not gone back to check, but I believe you get that kind of feel um, in a lot of the songs on the Arctic Monkeys' first album, and it's great. It really gives you this, this brilliant energy, especially when they perform live around that time. And then you've got the option of sort of dragging slightly behind the beat, which tends to add a bit more weight. And this is something that I'm just beginning to learn about, because obviously if both instruments were behind, then you're just playing slower or you're slowing down. And um, this is something that I'm going to research a bit more in time. And so I, what I want to find out is, you know, which instruments should be behind the beat or on the beat, and what kind of feels are they going to create, get to a point where I can begin to play guitar a bit more reliably, always on the beat, so then I have the option to go behind or in front. What difference is that going to make to the feel of the song? Um, so from my initial research, I've not yet found a clear way to notate this on sheet music, apart from just saying, you know, played behind the beat or played lazily. And so this is something I want to research a bit more because there are some drum beats, for example, where everything is perfectly on the beat, but there'll be one thing that's not. So like there will be a snare that's a bit late or a bit ahead, um, which by the sounds of it are very, very difficult drum patterns to play. Um, but either way, we've definitely got another step a lot closer. The one thing this also brings to light is that this process could take a lot longer. So what that's made me think is perhaps in order to guarantee that I won't miss my release schedule of an episode, a full episode, every eight weeks from the beginning of May, every full episode on a song, what we can do is say perhaps that episode, rather than going episode one of playing with songs produced and episode two, we can then go to episode one perhaps of playing with songs acoustic. Because the format of that show is much simpler. You take the song, break it down into chunks, and then you find one thing you like about that chunk and one thing you want, would like to improve. And if that's an acoustic song, it's probably going to be the vocals or the guitar. Improve it in some way. Is it better than before? Yeah, great. Move on, and, uh, and before moving on, um, find a little a little way to remember it, something visual or what does it make you think of, what you can you link to it and where can you put it in a location of a familiar route that you go through so that you can then link it to the next location. Remember all of these little improvements and play them at the end of the show in a live performance that combines everything together. So that may be the new tactic that we'll go through, but I guess the thing that's come to light mostly from all this process is the more you learn, the more you can learn, and the more useful the information can become. So there's this uh, quote, I don't know where, I don't know if it's attributed to anyone, but it's mentioned in Jim Quick's book, and this was one of the most powerful things that really made me think, which is memories, our memories, things that we, re things that we remember, our memories, create the repertoire of which we think about, the repertoire in which we think as it were. That's probably the better way to say it. So memories create the repertoire in which we think, in which we can think. So, so what that means is you can't think, or we can't think, us humans, and uh, same for animals, they can't think about anything without having remembered all of the things up to that point in order to be thinking about anything at all. And the reason that's quite powerful is because I've often gone at a problem and think, well, I'll try this way and I'll try that way and I'll try the other way. But then eventually some time will pass and I'll either deliberately or inadvertently learn new information about whatever it is I'm trying to find out about. 
from someone else or from a book or from a website or a YouTube video. YouTube videos are very, very useful nowadays, I would say, especially those little short ones that get straight to the point, <laughs> unlike this one, hey? But this is more of a, a podcast series and this is a the video form so that you can uh, have another option to enjoy some of my content. So the point I'm making there is... I found for me personally, and maybe for you, it's very easy to get stuck into this cycle of thinking through a problem. And even if you thought of it from many different angles, I've still kind of just stuck on a loop and maybe you'll come to a solution, maybe you won't, maybe you will come to a solution, it's great. But chances are, when you then take the time to learn more about it, you'll probably have a whole bunch of different ideas and a whole new set of approaches, which is also why in the book... Again, Jim Quick's book, Limitless, why he stresses how hugely important it is to read. And I'm still not quite there with a lot of reading and and, and getting through a lot of books. But the reason it's such a big deal is because the fastest that most people speak is about 100, 150 words per minute. So if you watch a YouTube video or you watch a movie, that's not that many. Uh, When people read, like normally they'll maybe get up to about 250 words per minute, especially if you use your finger and you can follow along, or these visual spaces, which is something I'm still trying to learn a bit more about. But if you begin to employ some speed reading skills about not going back and looking over the line, which is called regression, so you just keep going and a lot more will go in than you realise and you'll get more of the context of what you're reading... And you can visual, if you visualise every word, it makes it much easier to comprehend. And if you practice these techniques over time, I think Jim Cook's got a free video online and there's lots of books about speed reading. I also intend to, to learn about speed reading from, from other sources to find out, you know, is Jim Quick's method the best method? Or, or are there other ways to improve that skill as well? I should learn more, shouldn't I? I should find out more perspectives. But when you get to that point, you can get your reading speed up to, say, 500 or 800 words per minute. So suddenly you've gone from, what, 150, watching a podcast, or it could even be less, to 850. So that's, what's that, that's like seven times, roughly. So suddenly everything's taken that much less time. You've got all this time back and you've comprehended everything. Uh, And if you read faster and you practice it as a skill, you do actually end up not only reading faster, but understanding more, um, comprehending it more, and remembering more as well. One of the big reasons that we continue to read slow is because we we read it in our head, and we don't need to say the words in our head, and because we get bored. You know, we read so slow, and it's such an effort, and your mind wanders, and and you fall asleep. So that's been quite an exciting revelation, something I'm going to pursue. And that reminds me today I need to do a little exercise to work my reading muscle. It's quite fun, this one, where you you read for four minutes with your finger. Then you read the same bit in three minutes. Then you read the same thing in two minutes and the same thing in one minute. Well, it's, it's quite fun, actually. And then you continue reading after that point for two minutes and you work out your average reading speed so you sort of take three lines average lines and add them together divide them by three that's your average words per line and then you count the number of lines like only proper full lines or sometimes I'd up two half a lines to make one line and then you would um, times those two scores together so that'd be the number of of the average words per line and the number of lines and then you divide that by two because you did it for two minutes you see and then you would know how many words per minute you read and that's a really great exercise especially if you combine it with visualizing each word that you're writing each word that you're reading as well oh that's given me a thought i wonder if it could help to visualize the words as you write them not just as you read them quite possibly that might create another association to remember what you're writing in the first place. Who knows? So there's been lots of bits and bobs here that you might think aren't completely focused on playing with songs, but they do all have a major, major impact. I do hope that some of this information has been helpful to you and then you can use some of it. And if not, I hope it's maybe got you through 
I would say your commute, but I mean, who of us are commuting now? Not many. Maybe you're commuting when this uh, pandemic is all over <laughs> and you're listening to the old episodes. If so, is, is everything all right now? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Or uh, well, maybe you're listening to this as, as you go to bed. That's what I often listen to podcasts to help me sleep. So if I've helped you sleep, then uh, I'm I'm pleased. I've been able to help you. So do take care of yourself. Look after yourself. Go easy on yourself in these tough times or even in the good times and the bad times. Just take care of yourself. So until next time, I've been Rob Langley-Jones and this was episode number four of The Making of Playing With Songs. So take care and goodbye. Goodbye.